It's Transport in the Time of COVID-19, update 13th of April 2021. Um, uh, don't forget to send me uh, links uh, and you can email me for the slides to be sent to you. Uh, go to chairrdrf at aol.com as usual. Uh, usual uh, format, uh, new piece to read and consultations to respond to, developments in the last week in UK and London, and the weekly rolling slides of the diversity uh, page, the delay page, uh, past articles, um, um, advertising, and your victim blaming tonight. Um, the theme this week is it's nearly a year on, and uh, it's not so much an anniversary of uh, uh, this webinar, but it's also about what's going to happen. Um, what's happening now as we come out of lockdown? What are the results of the last year? And I'll try and do something uh, special on that next week. Plus, uh, do look at the last slide of this presentation. Uh, you'll see what I mean when you, we get there. Anyway, uh, there's a fair amount, uh, not so much any news on what's happened on the ground, but uh, some reports and various things which you need to look at, which have happened since we last met two weeks ago. First thing is this survey report, that's a government report, uh, reasonable size sample, uh, London field work. And the question is, generally speaking, do you support or oppose the introduction of low traffic neighbourhoods in London? And if you look at total supporters strongly and tend to, it's 52 uh, support and 35 against. So that's pretty good evidence. Uh, the most recent uh, survey saying people tend to support low traffic neighborhoods in London. Uh, with re, uh, the question is on uh, support or opposing extending the congestion charge zone to cover all of Greater London. There it's only 25 support and 62 oppose. Um, I think it could have been better if it had been something about smart road user charging and given some indication of the amounts of money to be spent. Uh, that's a rather loose question, but it does show that uh, the battle on that will be more uphill than the one on low traffic neighborhoods. Uh, here's a must read for you. Uh, this was done by uh, Friends of the Earth and Transport for Quality of Life, uh, who've uh, formerly done stuff on climate change and transport policy. Uh, 27 actions local authorities can take to reduce car use. And do go to the briefing on that, do go to the source there, it is a must read. Uh, they go into this looking at the risk uh, the what the Climate Change Committee, which is the independent committee, which uh, is supposed to have some authority, uh, which says uh, we assume that approximately 9% of car miles can be reduced uh, by 2035, increasing to 17% by 2050. Now, um, Transport for Quality of Life and Friends of the Earth say, uh this is refer to this and say this pathway which they admit is conservative and the minimum to be achieved identifies a nine percent reduction in car mileage by 2035 and 70 percent by 2050 um this means much greater reductions in urban car journeys where modal shift is more straightforward than modal shift for longer distance interurban travel but they argue that we need much deeper and more reductions in car mileage if the UK is to make our fair share of global carbon emissions cuts to prevent more than 1.5 degrees of global warming. Uh, so uh, look at that. And remember, you can always quote the Climate Change Committee uh, on that 9% because that is an official uh, government uh, uh, advisor body. So do go to that report. 
and don't forget hosting uh, COP26 this year, so it's on the official agenda. Um, and this I reported last week, last two weeks ago, uh, travel adaptations during COVID-19 restrictions in the last year. That's by Greg Marsden and, and others uh, giving those figures, which I mentioned last week, do go to that CREDS report. Uh, now, this is new. This is uh, Cycling Injury Risk in London, Impacts of Road Characteristics and Infrastructure, published in Findings There. Uh, it's by Rachel Aldred uh, and colleagues. There's a short film about the project, uh, University News Story, and the papers are there, a related London study here. Uh, I had something to do with that at the beginning of it. Uh, uh, it's a case crossover study, but all the stuff which has been by produced by Rachel Aldred and her colleagues at University of Westminster Active Travel Academy do go to that link to, to there and to these various links as uh, a nice little video about it there. So do go to all of that. Um, I can send you uh, the links. Uh, when I finish this presentation, just email me on chairrdrf at aol.com. Uh, this is a good result from Laura Laker winning against Daily Mail. This is an IPSO ruling finding uh, the Daily Mail's coverage of the draft guidelines consultation inaccurate. Um, we will be having Laura Laker on at some stage when this report is finally out next month. Uh, this was about uh, the work done again, the Active Travel Academy on the road collision reporting guidelines. Uh, so the Daily Mail said, you can't say like rollouts, campaigners call for abuse of cyclists to be made a, a hate crime. Uh, and that is not what was said by the Active Travel Academy in their road collision reporting guidelines. Therefore, Ipso ruled against the Daily Mail and in favour of Laura Laker when she complained. So do go to that. Well done, Laura. Uh, while we're on apologies, uh, Lillian Greenwood uh, complained to the BBC News about their reporting of uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, in particular the Justin Rowlatt um, uh, piece, which was dreadful. Um, uh, also something by Nick Robinson. She's got a kind of half apology from the BBC uh, saying that Nick's, Nick Robinson's comment was wrong, um, but they didn't agree with her complaint with regard to Justin Rowlatt. So, you know, half apology, maybe better than none. Okay, your victim blaming for tonight comes from Avon and Somerset Police with this. Uh, so they said, today we're going out with the cycle cameras, which is good, but also trialing an air vest made for cyclists. This is, uh, this is like an airbag, which you have in cars for cyclists. You know, we really don't need this. And taking the lead from horse riders and motorcyclists on safety. Well, motorcyclists aren't a good example for safety, in my opinion, in terms of uh, their inherently hazardous nature of motorcycling and also the danger they pose to other people. Um, yeah, there it is. If you should want to buy one, I do hope you don't. The Helite, world's first smart air bike for cyclists. Um, now, here's the second one. I, I do actually like seeing a lot of this victim blaming coming out on Twitter from police services because there is such quick pylons uh, uh, full of justifiable and righteous anger from people. Um, uh, this is the one from Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue, wearing high vis, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there were 73 replies in the first day, all of them criticizing, and it's doubled since then. So good to see that response. Uh, Northumbria police said, uh, 
don't assume the driver ahead has seen you. So avoid busy areas in rush hour where possible. And this was uh, for saying something like that, uh, that was taken down pretty immediately by the police swiftly. That's good. Okay, here's Sarah Berry on um, Twitter talking about how she turned down a press request on low traffic neighborhoods and do read that all in some detail. Uh, it's a very good response about feelings, about how you feel and about false equivalence above all. Okay, here's all the stuff on LTNs which you have to read. Uh, don't forget also, Police and Crime Commissioner elections coming up soon. Soon, do read the Action Vision Zero uh, manifesto um, for uh, preparation for the vote for police and crime commissioners. Make sure your candidates have signed up to it. Uh, yeah, something by Phil Goodwin there. Uh, mentioned that last week. Um, last week I mentioned that, that's good. Uh, Carlton Reed on uh, Mr. Biden, um, Silvertown Tunnel, Peter Walker's book. Uh, do help, uh, do carry on find uh, uh, funding Transport Action Network. I'll say some more about them in a minute. Uh, do read that, that's a must read. That's Phil, uh, that's at war with the motorist. Um, yeah, this is new stuff on all the research on low traffic neighborhoods. Yeah, it's all in there. Right, 18 million pounds more announced for cycle training for children and their families, uh, SUVs. Uh, Christian Brand on why electric cars are less important than cycling. Um, this is very important today. It's the Cambridge Sustainability Commission on Scaling Behaviour Change. Uh, again, it's climate change, uh, very important, do read that. Um, that's a previous one. Something new on by Christian Walmart, uh, quick read for Labour Party people, uh, Professor Steinberger on climate change. This is the Phil Goodwin you absolutely must read. Old but worth a read, Understanding and Managing Congestion in London. That's a report for TfL a few years old, but good. Uh, this is new and absolutely must read. Uh, by Phil Goodwin. It's about the action taken in the courts by Transport Action Network against the road building program. Uh, yes, uh, no evidence that London cycles superhighways worse than traffic congestion uh, by Imperial College. If they could get that through to Professor Winston at Imperial College, that would be nice. Not that he's the kind of person who's going to be troubled by evidence. Um, the RAC Foundation say city drivers should think twice before buying SUVs. Um, I don't actually think that the kind of people who want to buy them will change their behaviour by being politely asked to think twice. Uh, but at least the, someone is saying from a motoring organisation that they're not a good idea. Diversity page, the news is that Isabel Clément gets an MBE. Everybody applaud. Well done, Isabel. We're going to hear from her shortly. Um, uh, and this, uh, that's new equity, new active travel infrastructure, spatial analysis of London's new low traffic neighborhoods. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide. And there is some news. Uh, the advertisements for Active Travel England are changing. Uh, no news on part six Road Traffic Act 2004. But what's happened with Active Travel England? As you know, the two senior posts were advertised and I complained that the salary was too low. So no doubt because of my uh, complaint there is a review of Active Travel England salaries. People who applied for the job have been told the advertisements have been withdrawn and there will be a review of appropriate grading and salary. 
and I my view is, as I've said before, that the top two posts, certainly the top one should be into six figures, otherwise you're not taking it seriously and uh, you won't get the right caliber professionals applying. Okay, in UK, uh, I mentioned this before, scheme to prohibit through traffic on the rural uh, lane network. Uh, and there's now more time for consultation. Well done, North Somerset. If you're in that area, do respond to that consultation. Oh yes, we've got something about, uh, uh, again, Manchester City Council who always turn up in the villains area here. Airport City Bridge, non-compliant lifts and no gentle gradient ramp despite st space available, which you can see here. It should have been, you know, using that space better. Um, Sightless Defence Fund still taking money to fight the Upper Shoreham Road uh, removal of the pop-up cycle lanes uh, by West Sussex County Council. Uh, yeah, Warwickshire, this is Adam Tranter. Oops. Uh, the Gorilla Park line stalled six months ago has been removed today by the council by, after a single complaint. Oh dear, that's a shame. It was nice. He's now thinking about buying a mobile one. Yoo-hoo. Uh, London has a nice little document about the change of a streetscape around Bank Junction again by City of London. Newham, nice response by Councillor Garfield um, to people complaining uh, about uh, what Newham's been doing. Do take a read of that. Hackney ambulance response times have gone down after LTNs went in, so that's good. Right, here's your naughty advert. Um, uh, this is the Hummer EV. It's an electric vehicle, so you won't mind being hit by that. Uh, and inside, it creates a cinematic in-cabin experience. The special performance mode is armed and ready. And uh, since everybody else has been having uh, reference to the late Duke of Edinburgh, I thought I would have a bicycle related one there. And here's the serious final slide. This is from Rupert Reed of the, the Green Party. Uh, he's saying we're mostly missing this last miraculous chance we have been given, the gift of being able to start again. This is it, the period of unlock, the time when we could transform and pull ourselves back from being over the brink. Uh, but mostly there seems to be a pressure to go back to what was killing our world and us. Um, I see this happening and soon the opportunity that we're gifted will be gone. So uh, he's talking about that. And that really applies to us because we've seen some good stuff go in and we need to press on with the good stuff and make sure we don't get back to the bad stuff of what we had before the first lockdown. And that's it. So any uh, corrections, anything I've got wrong, anything that people want to say that I should do? That's all Bob. Don't hear anything coming through. All good. I've missed you, Bob, in the week off. Didn't know what to do with myself last week, so uh, <laughs> for that. Sally, are you here? Hi, yeah, I'm here. That's the floor's yours. Okay. Right, can you see that? Yeah, all yeah. good. Good. Um, so I, I did this for a kind of just before Easter, and um, I think it I thought it's still worth drawing people's attention to this if you haven't seen it. This presentation is about um, a post that Kat Swanson has put up uh, on her own her own blog about shared space on kind of longer distance walking and cycling routes. And there was some discussion on Twitter about you know the benefits and drawbacks of, of combining this. Yeah. 
read it. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the kind of detail that she does here, but it did make me reflect on two routes that went in in Newcastle as part of the first round of the Cycle City Ambition funding in something like 2015 or so. One of them has got, they both run through green spaces. Um, they're both parts of much longer routes. One of them has separated space with quite an attractive kind of um, meadow sort of flowers and, and sort of sculptural kind of places in, in, in between. Um, and the kind of taller poles mark places where you can cross from one side to the other. And the other is a narrow and sort of a wider path, but sort of narrower overall, um, where walking and cycling is combined. And this second one, which is in Littlemore um, in Newcastle, is uh, on, on my route to and from school. So it's a it's a path that I'm used to coming into conflict with other people every day. Um, and I just wanted to talk about some of the things that were touched on in in, in sort of Kat's blog, but also in, in all of the different responses um, to, to her sort of question about what people thought about this kind of shared space here. So we're talking about walking and cycling. Um, rather than than driving and and I just wanted to show you what it really for those people who aren't maybe used to walking or cycling with children or or you know and also I think this this route had there are a lot of dog walkers uh, there are people we know who are visually impaired who use this route we also know that there are a number of people who who can't hear who use this route there are quite a lot of older people and in just sort of the day after she wrote that post on the way home, I took these photographs. Um, and the first one you can see, there's somebody with a child on the back of their bike and she's having to stop start all the time and let people know that she needs to pass because you quite, and that's quite hard work when you've got somebody on the back because you're really wobbly. In the second one, my friend here goes in front. I mean, we mostly have to cycle single file here because it is quite narrow. Um, and you can see that already that path ahead is busy. You have people cycling the other way. Um, and then in one of the images, you can see that somebody has can't wait. They've rung their bell a bit and then they've given up and they overtake. As my friend passed these two girls, they got a fright. I mean, she is literally cycling at probably about three miles an hour. But, it, you know, having somebody come up behind you can give you a fright. So they, they somebody swore. Um, her little boy she let out to run down the path but she had to give him that warning not to go on the path he had to stay on the grass but he had to watch the dog dirt because he might get you know because there, it's too busy and there are people cycling the other way and then finally when we get to the end there's sort of a load of bollards and there's often people coming the other way and there's a sort of whole load more conflict there so um i think when when People are designing these paths. I mean, I, I know why it was designed like this. It was designed like this because it had been a slightly narrower path just for walking. And the feeling would be that local residents wouldn't want a big wide path here uh, because it would be too much tarmac. And actually, it's just caused kind of a lot of problems for everybody. The dog walkers get really, really cross. <laughs> And, you know, the cyclists sort of end up kind of some people are really careful and slow down. Some people don't. They just do cycle quite fast. They're not necessarily aware uh, of what's going on. And it makes for kind of quite an uncomfortable experience for everybody, really. So I just wanted to share that. And I'm going to go back to that in case anybody missed it. Um, have a look at that blog. Um, and if you're thinking about designing shared space, commenting on this kind of space, um, just have to think about all of these issues that there are around it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sally. We've got a few people who uh, want to wade in to say there's some pretty good examples in real life like that, Enfield and Kingston and Cambridge. I've got a couple there, um, so they're kind of out there. Mark, you had your hand up first. You go for it, mate. Thanks. Well, I spent 10 years designing and building things like this. Um, some years ago working for Sustrans and plenty of us I think on here probably Tim certainly have designed and built it I think it's got to be very much horses for courses and, and one of the things you've got to look at is the estimated use by walking and cycling people walking and cycling because that's the Dutch have plenty of paths like that as well so it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a shared space but they it's only done where it's a very rural very low it, it's people walking on a cycle track not cycling on a pavement but in an urban area where you've got lots of people and particularly people making utility trips like you that you mentioned then yes we should be splitting it but i think we can't rule out the shared area either 
and as always it's got to be context and, and and researched and not not one or the other so i think your examples work perfectly because they're in urban areas and there are people doing all those things we've got the same problem down on the seafront here um the only thing to just mention is about speeds and obviously when you do have the separated paths people will go faster on the cycle side rightly so but then if people do walk on them we've just got the new one in brighton and people walk on the cycle side and then they get even more surprised so there needs to be a, 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 almost a room an awareness that people will be cycling faster on the cycle side um so just a few thoughts on that really yeah can i come back on that yeah i mean so both of those are are in inner city so they're both really heavily used i mean the first image i showed of the very pretty path has nobody on it i mean that was obviously taken as a kind of publicity shot and um, they're both very busy routes the, the one that has the shared path space people do walk on the other side it, and to my knowledge it's not a massive issue um and perhaps it's not quite as heavily used as the other one i don't know but i would i would definitely say it's very obvious that they're different you know they're different colors um and they're obviously there's signs on them um but yeah and it's also the, a width issue but i completely agree if you're not if you're in a rural area then it makes no sense to have you know just sort of double up to not double up Cool. And uh, yeah, there's a report that Sustrans did with Phil Jones as well, don't know the Phil's on, just on the flowers and where you say, and we, we used that in, in London as well. Um, yeah, Robert? Briefly. I, uh, yeah, I was thinking the, um, there are a couple of other things around Newcastle particularly, which work seemingly reasonably well, the, the main routes across the town moor, for example, um, where we've seen another problem um, arise where um, the local MP doesn't believe that they are rights of way when in fact they are um, and the restrictive entry barriers between at either end of those routes particularly the new ones that's gone up on the Westmore side of um, Nunsmore um, are clearly going to fail any uh, reasonable um, access um, equality act assessment um, with very huge or not huge small but very, very heavy gravity uh, closed gates um, and zigzag kissing gates and stuff. And I wondered um, around those inner city areas, particularly where we've got uh, lots of barriers still going up um, on very popular routes, what can we do to actually reflect back to people? This is wrong. This can't be right. You're actually um, restricting the use not only for um, less able-bodied people but cyclists per se full stop yeah right. no i agree with that I mean, one thing i would say and i suppose this is what i was trying to highlight in in in, in what i was saying is that um it, it barriers those big heavy gates are really really difficult for a lot of They're people to use. but actually even on that narrow path that i'm sure that, that the narrow path on the town where is just like those narrow paths if you have children with you it's incredibly stressful and, and in on a level that is not the same if you don't have children with you and equally those barriers where it's just it's not barriers it's just the triangle of bollards that's still a quite that isn't a kind of a difficult obstacle um more difficult for some people than others so i suppose what i'm what i'm trying to say is that there are there's a sort of level of of the difficulty that it causes these things cause different people and to really think carefully um about that you know that we're not just designing it for the sort of the able-bodied you know man that we you know we're always talking about thinking about how to how to design more inclusively yeah i think um there was a, an able-bodied but young very slightly built woman went through those gravity gates the other day and i videoed her doing it i did ask her before and, and she found it incredibly difficult just because the the heaviness of the gate and her slight build it was terrible well, you can definitely quote like gear change and LTM 120 that access control barriers should not be used. It's not a must, but it should. Uh, Ruth, um, do you want to come in just? Yeah, one more question, I think. Yeah. Very, uh, well, very quickly, I think it looked as if Catriona's was an image possibly of the new Malden Rainers Lane uh, cycle, which I did a couple of weeks ago, um, which is phenomenal, uh, except as I said, getting onto it's all from getting off it but they have the space to do it. So they have the space to do that kind of double thing with the space in the middle. 
Um, I've mentioned before the Harrogate Nidderdale Greenway, which is shared use about 10 miles going through um, Ripley. Um, that is all tarmacked. It's used by walking, cycling and horses, and everyone seems to be coping very well. They don't have, they've got some of those gates in place, but they're never closed unless they've had a bit of an issue and then they will close them for a while, police it and then open them again. So anyone can use it. Um, as you know, my experience from Holland, yes, they are in rural areas, but they are also in urban areas. And I think the problem here is we've still not got used to utility cycling as a thing. Um, so the people who are perceived to be cycling, the ones who are going fast and therefore spoil it for everyone else. But once it becomes more normal of children, parents, especially mothers to be cycling, that will improve. And you have to remember, I mentioned Brent, uh, some greenway there where nobody with wheelchair, nobody of any ability would be able to use it in the winter. So useless. So I'm all for shared use tarmac if we at least get it, that everyone can use it. And over time, I think behavior will change. Okay, we're starting to segue into Isabel's but yeah, but I'll just, um, sorry, Charles, I'll bring you in later, but I just wanted Bill Jones to come in because I was kind of prodding to see what he said. <laughs> Bill? Hi, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. I don't know, move, the, move the camera over there so I'm looking in the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, my interpretation of the, the status of LTN 120, yes, it is guidance like any other LTN, but here change is a policy statement of the government with Boris Johnson's name on it and a foreword. And if you read gear change, he says, we expect, it, it calls LTN 120 a standard. So when gear change talks about LTN 120, it describes it as a standard, which is really interesting. Um, and, it, and it says that local authorities will be required, I think you use that word, to embed LTN 120 in their own standards. And they will be inspected by Active Travel England to see whether they've done that. Now that, that to me is quite, that, I've never seen that kind of language before from DFT. So I think that is unusual. Generally, all, all local transport nodes are guidance, like manual streets is guidance and, you know, highway authorities can do what they like. They can make the roads out of cheese if they want to. But um, uh, I think it, this is different because they say we will, we will, we will come along with this pango and check whether you are applying LTN as a standard. Uh, and if you and if you're not, we'll take your funding away. So that seems to me to raise the stakes a bit. Now they haven't they haven't delivered on that yet, but that's what they that's what Gear Chain says. Right. So I was asked uh, to do a presentation about how in lockdown I have uh, uh, been using the LTNs um, uh, which have appeared uh, over the last year uh, and how inclusive they have been to me. Uh, so uh, it's all about uh, a lockdown and LTNs helping me to conquer London or uh, my personal perspective about uh, inclusive cycling in uh, LTN times. Right, uh, just for people who don't necessarily know uh, me and what I do, I work, I run Wheels for Wellbeing. We're a small charity based in Lambeth, have been since 2007. And we do, uh, we enable disabled people to discover cycling through our inclusive cycling sessions. And we are also, we have become the voice of disabled people who cycle. Um, we are run and led by disabled cyclists in the most. And I think that's what makes us uh, uh, different. This is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. This is me looking very cold uh, on one of my rides. This, uh, so this is real whistle stop for, again, those who haven't heard uh, of my story before. I've been disabled for pretty much forever. And um, I didn't become a, a hand cyclist until my mid thirties. Just uh, very briefly, when I was a tiny tot, I was like a lot of kids given a tricycle, uh, a rowing tricycle, actually, it was fantastic. Um, and then I grew out of it and then I didn't have anything to cycle on for many years. And then when I was 10, I was given a lovely uh, white shiny bike, uh, not this particular one. It was a bicycle, that's what my parents thought they'd try me on. We couldn't do it, uh, my feet wouldn't stay on the pedals, I could not balance and that was cycling done and over, uh, moving on. I, I knew supposedly, my parents knew I couldn't cycle. 
And then I was a woman in my mid thirties. I had a little boy who was then four. He got his little bike and I was potentially looking at not being able to take him to the park on my own anymore because I was in the park using a wheelchair. You cannot run after a, a uh, you cannot keep up with a four year old on two wheels uh, in a wheelchair across a hilly park or any park. So, the next decision had to be made, was I going to uh, buy what I knew about uh, to be a little bit more all-terrain, which was a uh, mobility scooter, which at 35, 6, I really didn't uh, uh, relish the thought of, but would have done. But uh, along with, during my research, I found out about the magic of clip-on hand cycles, which clip on on the front of a wheelchair, and that the rest, of, in a way, is history. I became a kind of a hand cyclist, which at the time, at the time, I didn't really think of it as cycling at all, but there you go. I then became a real so-called cyclist result. Uh, well, that's a photo that was taken uh, on a photo shoot by Sustrans when uh, we were helping them with uh, the accessibility of Quiet Way. Uh, this is Quiet Way 1, as you can see, very well displayed um, on the road surface. And it sort of, I have been uh, touting this particular picture. I love it. Uh, it's very cycling on the streets of London kind of message. Uh, except, oh, I think we've missed, uh, yeah, except that uh, in, uh, until lockdown, really, until this time last year, I was actually not cycling that much. Um, I was cycling from uh, my home to my work on occasions, but there were lots of issues with uh, being uh, really a day-to-day -day cyclist for me. Um, I didn't find that cycling in the dark was easy. Uh, I didn't really uh, like cycling in the cold. I wasn't really equipped for it. Uh, I really didn't like going to new places on my cycle uh, without you know, people who knew the way. And really the car, my trusted friend, uh, was generally a lot easier. It was just easier, quicker. If, if I was gonna cycle, if I was gonna travel in the dark, or in the cold or needed to go somewhere I didn't know in a rush, I would always take the car. And the reasons are many, uh, but one was traffic. I wasn't, I was okay, but uh, I didn't really find it, uh, I didn't relish the thought of going out in traffic where I didn't really know. Uh, potholes and camber are my nemesis. I am scared of uh, falling out if, uh, if there is too much camber. Tipping out of my chair when you're on three wheels, camber matters, as all people who I've had conversation with about uh, infrastructure know. Uh, potholes really could get me uh, to uh, come out of my uh, try of my bike. Uh, speed cushions, I could go on. The fact that there is very little wayfinding on streets for cycle for cycle routes means that it's I, t I used to take ages to plan a route, uh, and uh, I didn't find it easy to fix lights to my uh, unusual cycle. So, as I say, I used to uh, go back into the car for a lot of uh, a lot of unknown journeys. And then lockdown came, um, and LTNs happened, and I happened to live in Lambeth. Uh, where the end of that arrow is and uh, I was basically I became surrounded in LTNs. <laughs> I live in the middle of them uh, and literally there's one at the end of my road and I, I my, my cycle to work would be straight north from the, arrow, the, the tip of that black arrow to the other side of Brixton. Um, so really suddenly, uh, use, well one I wasn't really going into the office so it didn't really matter in a way, uh, but I used to, uh, I would have, you know, again in the cold, in the dark or whatever, I would have normally taken the car to go one end of Brixton to the other, which is very silly, it's only two and a half miles, but I would have done because that was the lazy way to do it. Um, and uh, as I say, suddenly in lockdown, lots of LTNs grew around me. I needed to also, because I was working in this ridiculously small little cupboard all day or week, um, I was uh, needing to find ways of exercising. Um, my And then I met, uh, while I was talking to friends, friends who were not disabled, women mainly, who were also in lockdown, obviously, in, their, in, in all their little ways, kind of locally, 
who cycle without much of an issue, but actually was we're talking about a lot of things which stopped me cycling. Uh, they didn't have the impairment on top of that but uh, they didn't find it uh, easy to find new routes. Uh, they didn't uh, really like cycling in the dark. They were really not, not, not enjoying cycling in the cold, etc. Anyway, so little by little, uh, something which I've, <laughs> I have titled hashtag Sunday Cycling Adventures came about. I'm about to try and come out of here to go into uh, a uh, link with lots of pictures. This might be another faf. Uh, am I going to dare do this? Uh, bear with me uh, because I want to show you some of the pictures. Uh, right, I need to look at my phone to find where these are. Oh, they're over here. Um, mm, 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 nope, not that one. This is brilliant. I'm, I'm looking at two screens. Ah, here we go. So uh, I'm just going to give you a very brief, while I carry on talking, uh, this is now, so I'm going to go back a year, uh, a year ago. So this is where it all started. My friend Jackie here uh, is a regular cyclist. She cycles pretty much everywhere on her local journeys, but I suddenly became next to her. I was actually an expert because I was interested in LTNs. I'd been listening. Obviously, I had my ear to the ground about all the cycling infrastructure and all the hoo-ha about it. And I wanted to go and check it out. So good old Jackie and a few other friends got to discover a lot about, they knew nothing about all this stuff, but they got to look at planters and all sorts of things. So we were cycling around on Sundays around London Oh, look at that. There's another LTN here. So this is in the Oval LTN near uh, uh, the Oval Cricket Ground. I don't know if you, yeah, you can see my pointer. Uh, this is uh, the Brixton LTN. I get all my rat runs, basically, little by little got um, cut off uh, by a lovely Lambeth Council. And I was on, I kept seeing, saying on, on Twitter, I, as a driver, my heart bleeds because I could see all of my lovely routes across L London where I could avoid traffic. They were all being shut away. And as a cyclist, I could see that suddenly there were new ways for me where I could avoid traffic and I could safely uh, ride about. So it was sunny this time last year, remember it? Uh, and little by little, we extended, my friends and I, our reach. So look at that, Buckingham Palace, hardly any uh, uh, tourists, uh, Covent Garden, oh, Relton Road LTN appeared. And I was um, <laughs> very proud of myself, taking them around all of these new little areas. Uh, we took, lo oh, look at that, uh, Ferndale LTN, another Lambeth one. Lots of pictures of uh, happy women taking in the sights in London. This is Burgess Park. I've discovered so many places. I drove by so many times before, but never actually took in. This is the Kennington, very interesting little scheme, which it, it was, it became a very negative storm on the disability Twitter. Uh, so I thought I have to go and test it out and take a few pictures and put them out there. Um, Oh, look at that. This is the Tulse Hill LTN uh, on our way home up the hill uh, with my friends. We got to uh, Halloween now. Um, and then we got even further, though this is testing out the uh, accessibility of uh, oh, uh, so many acronyms. Um, NCN uh, Route 4, bad accessibility features, pictures for my friends at Sustrans a little bit of uh, enjoying the sights and taking some arty pictures of London. I'd never cycle this far. This is us getting over to uh, Greenwich. Oh yes, uh, Cutty Sark. Um, and then where else have we uh, been? I took my friend Marguerite all the way to Regent's Park. Regent's Park, I had never ever obviously cycled to. I had only ever uh, driven and uh, taken my bike out of the boot and cycled around it. Now I can cycle to Regent's Park. Oh, look at that. On the people at Lambeth, wonderful. I've got a little friend on the Kennington uh, cycle uh, scheme over there. I'm just in love with Lambeth Council's uh, uh, engineers. They listen and they they act. Uh, we've got a mobility scooter on the same little bit of mobility infrastructure, as I call it. Then we went down with my friend Jackie to, oh, very far south, uh, the uh, L, L, whatever, uh, National Cycle Network Route 20. Uh, this is the Wandle Trail. 
as far as we could get to. Another few little tidbits of detail to send to Sustrans about slight accessibility fails, but they're not bad. And then it, uh, we, we did eventually get to the part, part I couldn't get to, so we came home, but we, I'd never cycled that far south either. And that took in not just LTNs, but the tiny bits of, um, well, it's done by TFL, isn't it? Bits along the, uh, whichever great big, massively scary road through um, Tootin to Collier's Wood, whatever that's called. Uh, this is now taking my friend to see the Pelicans in St. James's Park on the way to Spitterfields Market. That was quite far as well. This is me in the dark, of course. I didn't used to know how to uh, sort out my lights, but I've learned to do that. Uh, I can work against the cold now. I've got loads of gear. <laughs> I, I've worked out I need to wear um, uh, leg warmers on my knees because they don't move. They get extremely cold, uh, but I've sorted that out. Uh, West Norwood uh, Cemetery. I'm giving you a, a quick tour of uh, London in lovely pictures in the autumn. Christmas Day at Kennington Park. We didn't go very far, but we still went out. Um, and, and then the lights, of course, the London uh, uh, Christmas lights before they came down early in January. Wonderful, wonderful day. Again, completely in the dark, uh, but totally confident to do that. Well, mainly because there was really hardly any traffic as well, but um, I would never have used to uh, cycle into central London, let alone uh, at night time. Uh, this is all uh, just carrying on really. Then uh, in the second lockdown, we stayed more local. So I discovered loads of parks I've driven by hundreds of times. Ruskin Park here in Camberwell. Uh, what else have we got? Brom Bromswick Park, uh, south of uh, Burgess Park. Amazing little park. Uh, etc etc let me not bore you with uh, just South London pictures oh we went back to uh, West Norwood Cemetery um, in in the winter it was really quite grim but lovely in some ways um, right uh, South Bank etc we've been there before uh, Brunswick again and now I'm going to just accelerate up to this weekend this is Brixton this is not this weekend, this is recently through uh, Elephant Park over, oh yes, to work out a route for my friend to get to her appointment at Guy's Hospital because however good a cyclist she is, she didn't couldn't work out her way to Guy's Hospital. So we've done that for her. And then this week, last latest um, ride was all the way to, I was so proud to be there. The, to me in my, on to me, uh, sort of Twitter, Twitter cyclist, I was in London Fields, which so many of my friends live by, my, my cycling uh, campaigner friends live around there and further north. And with lovely Abigail here, who is a, a, a breeze a, a ride leader champion, she took us there. So actually I didn't have to, 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 to do the um, route planning but uh, we started talking about going to Hackney Marshes soon. So how unbelievable is all this? I am so chuffed. Now I'm coming back to my presentation. We're nearly there. I'm just finishing very soon. This is uh, my uh, <laughs> Vini Vidi Vici <laughs> slide. I have conquered all those bits of London. Who would have said, you've got A and B here. The A is my home. B is my work. This is where I used to cycle up and down occasionally a few times a year and pretend through my work that I'm a great cyclist, but really I'm a cycling advocate. I advocate for more with disabled people to cycle, but I wasn't doing very much of it myself. It's all come out now. Uh, but now look at this. I have London pretty much under my belt, uh, all the way down here to uh, the Wandle Trail, up to Islington. We will be going further up to Hackney Marshes, probably at some point to Stratford and the Olymp Olympic Park. London's my oyster, <laughs> the world's my oyster. And that is because we have had new bits of cycling infrastructure, which I have been aware of for a very long time. Well, the, the new bits, obviously I wasn't aware of, they've arrived. What I was aware of because of having worked with Sustrans uh, a few years back on the accessibility of quiet ways and super highways 
I was aware of the quiet ways, I was aware of the superhighways, I didn't have any around me, therefore I never used them because I couldn't actually find a safe way of linking up to them. Now that we've got the LTNs, and yes, I do still go on about how they're not necessarily super accessible for lots of other disabled people, but at least for me, who is now who has uh, had the equipment to cycle for a good number of years now, uh, and now I have environments around me which are accessible, I am now able to make proper use of it uh, and I am uh, therefore you know, able to stay fit even in lockdown, I have been able to. Uh, and I now have been several times to hospital appointments uh, at uh, Tom, the guy, um, St Thomas's Hospital near Westminster, uh, I wouldn't think twice now, I wouldn't bother to take the car, the car that used to be that much easier, much simpler, much uh, more kind of secure feeling. Um, I wouldn't, I, I will tell you what will force me back into the car is the rain, because sitting uh, in your wheelchair when you're cycling, you do get very, very wet. And I haven't quite sorted that out. And your wheelchair gets wet as well. So you're sitting in wet. That's not very nice. But other than that, I can do the, the dark, I can do uh, the cold and I can do distances. I can I can wayfind, I can plan. There are still massive uh, changes to be brought in as far as uh, wayfinding. I'm not the only person. Everybody says it's so stressful and so boring to have to stop and look at your, even if you can do the apps, you have to keep stopping and you have to keep looking. Uh, so wayfinding has to be sorted out. I mean, you know, putting um, uh, stuff on street to, to tell people where uh, I, Yes, the cape for the wheelchair, no, it doesn't quite work when you're hand cycling and it's sort of, you, everything's moving and it's going into your wheels, but thank you for the, <laughs> well, I'm still working on it and I will sort it out at some point. I will stop here, I think, I think it's my last slide, yes, um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, another plug for our jobs, they're on Twitter, they will be on, uh, uh, they, well, I'll tell you a tiny bit more about them, there's a, a head of campaigns and policy, 12 month job and there is a, a head of operations, another 12 months job. Eventually we hope to make them permanent, uh, but do come and uh, work for us if you have 12 months on your hands and the experience required. Uh, look, at, look them up on our website and we'll be advertising and uh, push it out to all sorts of people you know. Uh, we want good people and I want to uh, get some of my life back. That's why I'm creating those jobs. Uh, that's it for me. Brilliant. Thanks, Isabel. Just uh, inspirational as always. And, and a really good companion piece to the first talk you did about a year ago. It's uh, worked out nicely a year on. So yes. we're like, here's all the problems. And you go, well, look at the results. It's there. Uh, yeah, that, that's been brilliant. So we've got a cut time for a couple of questions, as long as the brief, because um, uh, I want to give time for Mark as well. But um, Andrew, did you want to come in? I'll come to you next, Mark. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I'm just just interested to know about you know because um, you said you, you you cycled to St Thomas's Hospital. Obviously, hospitals are notoriously bad for like public cycle parking, and obviously having an adapted cycle. I was wondering how that would work, and you know what you did with with the the adapted cycle, where where you could park it and things, and what your experience is like. Guess what? I cycle all the way into my appointment. I don't leave my cycle anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> my, you, you, uh, as you saw on the pictures, my cycle is attached to the front of my wheelchair. If there was somewhere safe for me to store it, it would need to be uber safe uh, because it's, it costs uh, not far off 5k. Uh, I would not leave it anywhere, uh, and, but I can and nobody challenges me. If I was a disabled cyclist on two wheels or three wheels upright, I think I would be challenged and that's you know, one of the many continuing um, elements of communication we have to, to get through is to, uh, to the, the whole thing about cycles being mobility aids and enabling cy disabled cyclists to cycle uh, indoors sometimes or in pedestrianized environments. But the whole issue of cycles secure cycle storage for expensive cycles, uh, I mean, let alone any cycle, but um, for cycles which are so crucial and so expensive is a big issue. So that's another area of, of work that we, we, we're pushing with. Excellent, thanks Mark, wanna come in? 
this this marker or other marks. Yeah, yeah. You um, know. very quick question. When we were doing Greenwich, uh, big Greenwich study, um, year or so ago, the area around Cutty Sock, there's a lot of very very strong signs saying cyclists dismount, no cycling here, go away. D did you have any problems in that area? No, I mean again. Um... I don't think anybody would dare come to me and say, please dismount, because they can see I'm sitting in a wheelchair. So I'm, I'm one of those lucky disabled cyclists. I am actually visibly disabled and nobody ever, I mean, I have cycled past so many police people, community security people, whatever, and nobody's ever given me any jib. I mean, I do say to my friends who went, who are on two wheels and who are not disabled, I always say we are entering pedestrian environment. <laughs> you know, you're go you guys are gonna need to, to walk because I, I don't want us to create a, an issue. Uh, but, um, and, and anyway, they would because being on two wheels, they can't cycle slowly, which I can very comfortably, thank you very much. Um, and um, they, so I never get any problems, but there are plenty of, disabled people who could, who might get into trouble. Uh, I don't think I recall seeing anybody uh, on that particular ride that, you know, would have um, uh, bothered anyone, but you never know. So, some, you know, somebody who cycles on two wheels but cannot walk their bikes, can, you know, would continue to potentially have issues of being asked to dismount, but yeah. There are gates and all sorts of things around there as well and bad surfaces and it's not brilliant. Yeah, yeah. We didn't go further than Cutisa because we'd got to the, you know, we had to get back to South London. But um, there, there were some bad bits on the on uh, NCN uh, 4, uh, like the, the route took you. I mean, uh, one of my pictures is, you know, from the top of a set of stairs, which is which is the cycle route. <laughs> but we found th there was a perfectly excellent uh, alternative route, accessible alternative route, it just wasn't marked, we had to go and find it. Anyway. All right, well brilliant, we'll leave it there as well, but I'm sure you'll be there in the chat as well if anybody has any further questions. And we'll, we'll go over to Mark now. Uh, be there. Other, other Mark, Mark Hodson, let's say, not Mark Strong. Thank time. you, Brian, fantastic. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're all good. Brilliant. Um, thank you for having me back again. Um, today, due to popular demand, we're going to do third party reporting, um, a discussion around third party reporting, but the focus on um, the feedback process, which is so problematic, but um, is a vital part of the actual process if it's going to work, especially going forward. Um, I did plan this originally with slides, but when I practiced it, it took far too long. So those who wish to see this with slides will have to wait till the conference season starts proper once we're out of lockdown and uh, I might do it then. Um, but it's going to be solely for my notes. Um, and so here we go. Right, we're going to start with third party reporting and an overview why it's important and why it works. Well, many years ago in 2014, 2015, when we first started um, experimenting with third party reporting and people's footage to prosecute defences, uh, we knew straight away it worked um, just because the evidence was so good and it was so easy. Um, there were a few naysayers that said it couldn't be done, but the, the process is exactly the same as using police evidence, so we knew it would work. It gave us a, a huge number of benefits that we couldn't get from obviously detective offences. Um, for a start, high quality evidence, the cameras, even back in 2014, 2015, were much better quality images produced than we had, say, in the cameras in our police cars, and still are to this day. We don't have HD cameras in, in any of our police cars, which is quite problematic at work. But the stuff that we're using out on the streets now, um, in our own cars, on helmet cams, wherever it may be, even on your phone, produces a much better standard of, um, of footage. And things like the, the, the vehicle registration marks are really easily seen on footage. So when it comes to identifying potential offenders, no problems at all. The other things we found, extra opportunities to target the most dangerous people on the road. We, as police, we knew we couldn't be everywhere. And there's nothing more frustrating than talking to a victim of a road traffic, you know, danger, what I would call crime. Crime is what it is. Don't let's dress it any other way. Um, it is crime. It, you know, it, it, people call it all sorts of things, but they are criminal offences. Um, we can't be there all the time. There's nothing more frustrating as an officer having somebody relay an incident to you and saying, and you having to turn around and say, well, it, it's your word against theirs. Cameras changed all that. And when people start giving us the footage, it gave us those opportunities to target those people who really did endanger other people. 
Most importantly, it gives a 24-7 credible chance of an offender being detected, evidenced and prosecuted. And we call it the average speed camera effect. Average speed cameras work wonderfully well because drivers know that they're effective. And if they speed through an area, they're going to be caught. Um, third party reporting using video evidence it gives exactly the same for every other road traffic offence. And, and that should not be dismissed you know, lightly, it really is a game changer, probably the game changer in my career when it comes to traffic policing. Um, you can cover um, most offences, which is a real big winner for behaviour change, wholesale behaviour change as well. There are some things that you can't cover using third party reporting, things such as speeding. Um, you can cover some extreme speeding offences. Problem with speeding is, is that you do, for, to ascertain a speed from a video clip, you have to use frame rates and it has to be done by a professional on the collision investigation unit and it's timely and cost, not really cost effective when it comes to the other you know, ways that we do detect offences, but everything else can be detected. Some things can't like seat belts because questions have to be asked, you know, say a seat belt offence, you know, is the seat belt working? Does the person have an exemption certificate? But everything else generally can I give you some examples, you know, um, children sitting on laps of people in, in the front seats of cars, you know, the danger due to the way that passengers carry that offences. Um, all the things that you don't normally associate with, you know, third party reporting, insecure loads, you know, just a good bit of footage, everything that can endanger the road users. Generally, you, you can report it in a third party manner. Um, and so it's got a very wide reaching, you know, um, effect on all sorts of offending. And it's easy to do from a policing point of view. It's cost neutral or even cost positive. Now, this is the one thing that people don't seem to realise. We had it costed out when we first started doing this by um, a, a chief inspector, Kerry Blakeman, who's now retired, bless him. And he got very interested in what me and Stephen doing. He did a business case analysis on it. And he came to the conclusion that um, without any extra income, and I'll come on to the extra incomes at the moment, it was costing 9p per submission um, for the police. And that 9 pence, that was, you know, we just stood there. He said, you know, you sure we got that right? He says, yeah, we've done the figures. It's 9 pence. That's what it's costing us. So it's incredibly cheap. But it becomes cost positive because what, what happens is, is when we get extra avenues of detecting offences and those offences aren't contested because the evidence is good, then generally they, their disposal is of, you know, in a number of manners, one of which is a course, if the person's eligible, which the police get a kick back off. OK, and the other one is, is ultimately if it's a severe offence or the person's not eligible for conditional offer or for a course or, or you know, um, which is contest matter, of course, it goes to a police led prosecution, single justice court. Um, a guilty plea there um, results in a, um, costs of usually about 100 to 110 pounds for the police led prosecution team. They can do 30 in a day which more than covers the cost of the police prosecuting those offences. So it becomes a cost benefit to the police. Um, so from a cost and demand point of view up to this stage, you know, from a police force point of view, it, again, there's, there's no barriers to it whatsoever. Then we had the development of the next place portal, which really opened it up and gave no excuses to any police force ever. You know, next place, they produced the cameras, they produced this lovely little portal. So as you submit your footage here, complete this little, um, statement that we've provided for you we'll pass it on to the police force um, the urban police force and they can action it and so the police force then didn't even have to build a digital reporting um you know portal or format because we had a ready-made one all you got to do was you know have somebody at the other end triaging all the offenses and the triaging is very quick from a police point of view because literally a person would come in on the morning that open up the you know, the inbox, look at the, case, the footage, the footage two to three minutes per clip. And it literally is from a trained professional point of view, that's, pros that's pros prosecutable, that's not. So literally when you triage offences, you can do up to you know, 20, 30 in an hour sometimes. So it is quite a quick process. In course with third party pros, um, reported offences, what you find is, is that the evidence is that of a victim or a concern member of the public. And it, the evidence given by somebody, if it does end up at court from a third party reported offence, is taken in a very different light to a uniformed officer reporting a traffic offence because the courts see that person, you know, not as the police officer. It's 
somebody from society whose behavior changed because of this offense committed by a, usually a driver. And so the resulting weight that is given in court and the weight then in sentencing is a lot more. And what you tend to find is the sentencing from third party reporting offences is slightly higher than that from, you know, those reported by a uniformed officer. I've sat in on many trials from, you know, third party reporting offences um, and you see a significant difference in the way that the evidence is dealt with by the court because it's not somebody from the police who, you know, like it or not, they, they see us as having, you know, um, amounts of offences that we've got to get processed or anything like that. It's not the case at all. We, we don't have targets at all in the police. It's a bit of an urban myth. But again, because it's a normal moment of the public, it just it just handled in a very different way and in, in, in the way that it should be, if you like. Third party reporting also gives a different access channel to the police. And what we, we tell, started to find is, is that people wouldn't, who wouldn't normally report things to the police would suddenly start reporting things to the police through third party reporting. And you started getting offences that you wouldn't pick up anywhere else. So people who report things as road traffic offences, and I'll come on to this later when it comes to the feedback, but then they report a road traffic offence that then turned out to be not a road traffic offence at all, but it's a public order offence, or in some cases, a racially aggravated public order offence. These are the sort of offences that as police forces we really need to pick up, you know, because they're not traffic offences, they're offences against the person and, and could be a lot more serious. And all of a sudden you have another avenue for people reporting those. And if the, the option was phoning the police and having to speak face to face with the police officer, they wouldn't have done that. So the, you know, the digital reporting of a third party offence just gave us access to those sorts of offences that we never had before. So as you can see, third party reporting overall is a bit of a no brainer for everybody involved, for the road users, for the police, you know, there's just everything's a win win until we come to feedback. And this has been the real crux of the matter throughout. Now, it is the one problematic area we have regarding third party reporting. But first of all, we have to look at why feedback is important. Um, and I, I'll give you an example of why that we look at feedback in the police regards road traffic offences, regards officers. Now, in, in my most prolific years when I was on the road harm team, I'd be prosecuting in the region about 3,000 offenders a year. Um, I would get feedback on about 50 cases at those 3,000, and those are the cases I went to court with, unless I had a, you know, a specific interest in a case, because I thought that was a really bad one, I'm going to find out what happened to it. And that would take me a long time to find out. And that is the way that the, the police force views feedback, you know, in regards to road traffic offences, that was their normal course of business. But why it's important, again, you have members of the public reporting, is because it improves the process. Um, part of the brilliance of third party reporting is the victim empowerment you have these people who have basically been victims of, of driver behavior or of, you know other road going behaviors all these years um, and have nothing you know no recompense against it you know basically and no way of, of having any sort of justice regards what happens to them on a daily basis and when i say justice it sounds a bit you know it can sound you know a bit exaggerated and a bit excitable but let's face it all those that use active travel will know that if you go out on a journey you will genuinely be sometimes endangered seven times on a journey that doesn't happen to car drivers at all you know and, and so that that balance being brought back into the system is very important and so the feedback was very much you know letting people know now police have long recognized the importance of witness and victim feedback updates in other areas so if i was to arrest somebody for an assault I, when i'm processing that prisoner um, in the block i would have a checklist to go down and say have you informed the witnesses have you informed the victim of all the, the, the progress and everything like that and very much so that the police know how important feedback is in other areas. We've just got to apply it to the third party process, um, if you like, to get the same benefits from it. Um, the only issue is, is that feedback causes demand. Now, in the third party reporting process that we've talked so far, there's been very little demand created. And this is the reason why it causes demand. Um, but before I move on to demand, I'd just like to put it in the backdrop of police forces at the moment don't like demand. Um, we're hard pressed as it is, you know, we've suffered lots of cuts 
and we're going to have a very busy summer. We've got mutual aid requests down to port because, you know, problems with Brexit. We've got mutual aid requests to because of protests. Um, we've got the COVID crisis, you know, to deal with as well, um, not only in the means of enforcement, but also shortages of staff because of isolating and things like that. Um, so, you know, anything that does create demand without a very noticeable um, benefit, please tend to shy away from. There is a very noticeable debt benefit, and I'll come on to that towards the end. But why feedback is problematic, it's individual. Um, back in 2017, when we handed over um, the third party reporting process in the West Midlands to the Traffic Investigation Unit, we never really thought about feedback as it got upscaled. Because when me and Steve did it, you know, we were doing 350 cases a year, and it was very good. We'd come in would have cases sent to us from, you know, our usual um, reporters, some very good, the ones we could trust. Um, and on the whole, we could phone somebody, say, I'll give an example, I'm sure George won't mind me uh, mentioning, but George Reeves, um, who works for Cycling UK as a regional representative, we could phone him and say, George, yeah, your clip's excellent, it's up to the standard as usual, clear offence, uh, the nip's going out, um, check the driver out, he's got no points on his license, he's never had a course before, he'll probably end up with the course. It was a five minute conversation. Then we had other conversations with people that we, you know, we had to phone up and say, you know, you cannot stand in front of the bus and threaten the life of the bus driver in front of all the people on the bus because you're committing a public order offence. And that turned into an hour long conversation, but it wasn't a problem for me and Steve because literally we were coming into work sometimes an hour and a half early to get all this work done before we started our normal work, driving, you know, the traffic car around the West Midlands doing the usual work. So we never really thought about the feedback process. Um, but it was important because we, we could tweak behavior changes. If we had a clip, well, you know, sometimes we'd get clips off some cyclists and, and we'd look at them and go, you can't carry on cycling like that. You know, you, you, you're cycling far too close to the curb. You've got them in a primary position there. So there were benefits to all aspects of, you know, we're improving people's cycling at the same time. We're improving people's driving. You know, um, you know, we, there was lots of other aspects that we were improving all the time. But to do it properly, it takes time. And time, like I said, unfortunately, when it comes to policing, is demand. Um, each bit of feedback that you give from a third party reporting port is individual. And the only way you can do it is one-to-one -one communication. I've tried to think through lots of, you know, digital ways and IT ways of doing it, but you can't because each clip's individual and you've got to interact with that person and say, right, your clip's good because of this. Your clip's bad because of this. There's no specific, what you know, parameters you could put into an algorithm or a program to, to, to do it digitally. You've got to have a human interaction when you do it. Types of feedback, the positive ones, it's great to have a clip that comes through and 95% of the clips that you do get sent through, even now, are of fantastic quality and people generally know what is an offence, what is an offence and what we expect. So the positive feedback is really easy. You can phone the person or send them an email, send them a letter, say, thank you very much for your clip. You know, it meets the evidential criteria, yet the offence is met and this is the way it's going to be disposed of. Now, the, some forces use letters, warning letters as disposals. I'm not a great fan. We don't do it in the West Midlands. Personally, I think when it comes to the driver behavioural change, warning letters are a waste of time. Um, if you tell somebody not to do it again, the you know, otherwise they're going to be caught. They generally don't believe you. Um, but in the West Midlands, we offer, you know, three other disposals. You've got your course, you've got your condition offer or court. So you're phoning the person saying, right, this person's probably going to get a course, going to be offered one in the first instance. If you don't take it off, they'll, offer, they'll be given a conditional offer of, you know, three pounds, or, you know, three points and a hundred pound fine or whatever the condition offer is for that offence. Or they'll end up at course, you know, a court disposal. Um, and very few people actually attend court from third party reporting matters, um, you know, you have to be a very prolific offender, um, very prolific um, reporter, sorry, to attend a court, you know, at least a couple of times in a year. So the positive feedback is very easy to do. Um, where the time's taken is with the, the, the not positive um, feedback. And there's lots of things and lots of reasons why some clips won't make the evidential standard. Um, for a start, lots of people um, tend to report things that aren't actually offences. 
Um, it happens a lot more with drivers than people using active forms of travel. Um, for example, you'll get drivers reporting offences and, you know, um, you'll get some, I mean, as we're in this forum, uh, here's a cyclist riding on the pavement and then you'll view the clip and go, yeah, that's a shared path. Um, here's a cyclist not using the cycle lane. Oh, yeah, they don't have to use the cycle lane. And so, you know, but you've got to phone these people and tell them, put them right, because like I said, there's different types of feedback and it is beneficial you have a conversation with this driver and say you need to go back and revisit the highway code because you know and then, and then submit some more footage for us when you know what you're talking about um so there's lots of things like that, that we have to deal with and then there's things that other things that aren't traffic offense like i said you'll get some clips submitted and people say oh, i had this traffic offense and you'll look at the footage and go well actually no that's a road traffic collision because they've hit you you need to submit this form actually that's an assault because the person's laid hands on you. Uh, never mind the traffic offence. They, they, sh they shouldn't be doing that. Or it's a public order offence because, you know, that you know we see lots with drivers, don't we? People getting out of cars, waving things about, saying, you know, all sorts of things. And so they're then passed on to another department to deal with, you know, the, the, just, you know, crime reports that have to be done. It has to be investigated. This person has to be brought in an interview. And so we move on from what is a, you know, a general... Um, traffic offence to a, a much more serious offence against the person not a negative thing in any way because we're picking up offences that should be picked up but you know as a police force they're coming through a different avenue and there are offences that wouldn't have been reported to us before so it's something we should be grateful of but again it creates demand and, and police forces are you know don't like demand like i said um the rejection of evidence um again not to standard you gotta have conversations with people and when it comes back to feedback and the classic ones are people who report other drivers especially report um red light offenses this person's done a red light so you'll view the clip and say fantastic i can see the lights red but i can't see the stop line on the clip so unless i can see the stop line and the red light i can't say to a court here's the person going across the stop line when the light's red because they might have been already across the stop line before the light was red um, and there's lots of little specifics like that you have to outline to people to improve the evidence that they then submit next time because what you don't want to do is lose these people from the process because the more people you have submitting evidence the more chances you've got to prosecute those people who are truly dangerous to other people in society when they drive motor vehicles and you don't want to put them off so again it's why feedback is important you can only be done one-to-one -one, but it has to be a telephone conversation with this person to improve their evidence um We'll only take 100 percenters. So literally, like, it's like I always say with the close pass stuff, when we said, unless you watch a clip and there's a shark intake a breath, or you go, oh yeah, that was really close. They're the ones you want to put before a court because you've got to look at the overall picture of why we do it as a police force. From the personal point of view, the people submitting, like I said, it's victim empowerment. It's a chance to, to do your bit for society. From a police force point of view, it's about wholesale driver change behavioural change to drive down the amount of KSI as you get on, on the roads and reduce demand. There's me talking about demand again, but that's what it's all about, to free yourselves up to do other sorts of policing. Um, what you don't want to do is, is weaken the work stream. So you don't want to put things into court that you're going to lose because as soon as that happens, drivers won't have the same psychological effect of thinking, well, if I do get caught, actually, people are getting away with it when they're reported by other people. So we don't want that. So literally, again, we only take the 100%ers. So if there's any sort of weakness in the evidence, um, again, it's a lengthy phone call to the person reporting saying, this is why we couldn't use your evidence, sorry, but next time, can you do this, this or this, and maybe not say this, you know, <laughs> anything like that. Um, submit a behavior, which takes me on nicely. I said, don't do this. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had clips before when I've had people threatening a bus driver in front of a, a bus load of people, you, you can't, do that when it comes to a bit of bad language courts and the police will go yes yeah, natural reaction if you saw me in a traffic car at work some of the language that comes out of my mouth when i see people do stuff or when you're in the middle of a pursuit you know i stand there in front of a court and say your, your worships i'm really sorry you're going to hear some abhorrent language from myself but it was you know heat to the moment you know and i was generally you know afraid for my safety or other people's safety and you know i've had magistrates turn around as a result and say don't worry it's perfectly accepted we don't blame you you know under the circumstances warranted and it's the same with people you know submitting stuff if you have somebody who genuinely endangers your life you, you are going to come up with the, the odd cuss word there's no two ways about it what you cannot be doing is chasing that person down yeah. and, and threatening them in any way you know be the better person let them go unfortunately we have some clips where we uh, you know you have that 
you know, the driver is going to be done for a road traffic offence, but due to the, the person reporting's reaction, they're going to end up being done for a, a public order offence or an offence against the person sometimes. So again, you have to phone, explain, you know, if you want to follow this through, there's a good chance you're going to end up, he's going to end up with a driving conviction, you're going to end up with a criminal conviction. Next time, let's do things differently. So again, feedback is all very individual and very tricky, you know, and, and it becomes a lengthy process. It can escalate into conversations of more than 30 minutes, I know, because I've been there and done it. So there's the problem we suddenly have, uh, a demand issue. Um, every other part of the third party process is really effective for everybody involved until we get to the feedback. Now, can it work? Well, the good news is, yes, it can work and feedback can be done, but this is the way to do it. Third party reporting can be done at a local level where officers and PCSOs have time to do the feedback. Um, it's perfectly evidenced by Operation Park Safe running in the West Midlands. Operation Park Safe, for those who don't know, it's an effective way of reporting all parking offences that endanger um, those that need the pavements or, you know, um, active travel users or, you know, other drivers, by the way, manner in which vehicles are parked. Um, I went round and I upskilled every single neighbourhood officer in the West Midlands uh, during 2018, 2019, part of which was the third party reporting process. The difference being that all parking offences, uh, and it includes zigzag lines, vehicle left in dangerous position, obstructions, you know, um, at the whole caboodle of parking offences is they went to the local neighbourhood team in their local um, email box. So the person would fill out a online reporting form, um, a pro forma statement, submit their photographs and, and bang it through to the local neighbourhood team. They would then triage it and they're fantastic, we can use this, we'll send out, a, you know, we'll, we'll do the ticket and the NIP will go out. Um, or basically um, they'd say, not this time, this reason, or they'd tell them what the other disposal was, because the great thing about neighbourhood police is they could go around, knock on a door, say to the owner of the car, do you realise you're blocking the pavement for Mrs Miggins who lives down the road and needs to use the mobility scooter, and they would go, sorry, I won't do it again. So at that sort of level, the local neighbourhood policing level, there's plenty of time and the feedback can be given in the ways that I've described and you can improve the process. And it's almost like the golden chase of policing when it comes to repeat calls at uh, local neighbourhood policing. Because you've got that repeat caller, you can say, right, well, you give us the evidence, you fill out the form, we'll make your problem go away. Or the person thinks, well, they give me the ideal solution, I'm just not going to phone again. And so it reduces demand for the police. So it's a real win-win situation. The problem's solved or the demand goes away from the police. And generally the problem is solved because these people are phoning already. When it comes to the large scale upscaling that we're looking at, you know, the thousands of offences being submitted by, you know, dash cam, head cam, cycle cam, people on buses, filming people on phones. We need a national approach, okay? Uh, and this is where it's gonna become a little bit trickier and it's up to people like me to do the work. Um, to do this to make this happen and i'm already looking at doing it there needs to be a business case analysis to show that the full benefits of third party reporting over office detected offenses and third party reporting offenses are cheaper than office detected offenses away from you know the, the real volume stuff like speed because you can't get somebody in a, in a um a van um you know you can't get cheaper than that detecting speed and offenses or a static camera but when it comes to things like due care phone offences, um, red light offences, all the things that are normally office detected, you're not going to get a better way of detecting them than third party reporting because it's everywhere all the time, like the reasons I've already said. So it's up to people like me to go around, prove for a, a business case and I say, this is the cheapest way of doing this. If we do this, we're going to save money over and above offices detecting them. That will then lead to initial investment and the initial investment is just on the feedback. Like I said, we already have everything in place for the actual reporting. The feedback's the last piece of the jigsaw, if you like, that just needs to slide into place just to satisfy those people that are reporting. So have that 100% feedback with everybody. So then with a small investment, a small number of staff who make the phone calls, who've got the knowledge to say, and they can be retired police officers, they can be volunteers, you know, it can be anybody. But to phone these people and say, you know all the things that i've just covered that would then complete the jigsaw of third party reporting 
but it's that case has got to be made and it's a short-term investment because let's face it whether we, we you know whether you believe in autonomous vehicles or not in 50 years we're not going to have these problems you know we're not going to have in 50 years time people driving you know cars 50 years time we're still going to have people punching each other we're still going to have people you know fighting each other um we're still going to have people stealing stuff but road traffic offenses as time progresses technology and um if you like the way that we deal with offenses we'll see less and less of them there's no two ways so it's a short in in policing terms it's a very short term investment um so it's not nothing you're going to look at going on and on the other thing we need standardization and this is the one thing that really gets me as a police officer is that i live in staffordshire um and if i report in staff an offense in staffordshire it's dealt in a very different manner to if i reported an offense in west mids i'm a central motorway police officer if i drive up the m6 and cross a boundary line the thresholds change regards speeding. I can do somebody for doing a lot less speed in Staffordshire than I can in West Midlands. You can't have that when it comes to a justice system. Um, you can't have people being offended against in one part of the country being dealt with in a different way to another part of the country because if you did that of the sorts or sexual offences or anything else, you know, people would be up in arms. What happens with road justice? I, I, I to this day, I still don't know. Um, but there's got to be some kind of standardisation. Um, but moving that forward, the only way that's going to happen is if you have a national roads policing unit, the same way you have British Transport Police, um, you know, and everybody, the same rules apply everywhere. Regards actioning, what is actioned when you get the third party report and the way it's disposed of, because, you know, there's stuff coming into West Midlands that would get a course a fine or sent to court then in other parts of the country they'll get a warning letter now you you can't have that you just you just can't have that at all we need that standardization um and we the police across the country have got to recognize the importance of third party reporting invest the prioritize um in third party reporting is widespread now but you just don't hear about it in the press you know, we don't, you know, it's not put out there. If drivers knew the scale of third party reporting, who's been caught for what, under what circumstances, you'd have more people reporting, you'd have more people changing their behaviour because they think they're caught, and the actual system would get more priority as a result. It would probably overtake, you know, the kind of traffic policing that I do on a day-to-day -day basis because it's much easier to do. It's a lot cheaper. It costs a lot of money to train a person like me. It takes five years to take to just to train a, a traffic officer. That's without the initial training as a police officer to the required standard. That's what they say. And, the, you know, the courses cost tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Horrible thing to say. Third party reporting. Is it traffic police on the on the chief? Yes. Is it the most effective form of traffic policing? Probably we're going to see going forward. Probably yes again so that's why you know and i've centered on feedback today as the one thing that you know is the hardest part of the process but it's probably the most vital part of the process if in the future it's going to reach its full potential because without thanking the people and you know um getting people who report um, to improve the product that they give us, that product being the evidence, if you like. I'm not into vigilante policing in any way whatsoever, but genuine victims who carry, you know, cameras, who witness offences or, you know, are offended against by drivers, I am very much in favour of because that's what the system's there for. Um, many, many years ago, when we first started, me and Steve, we did have somebody come down to the West Mids who I would call a... Um, a tourist, if you like, he lived in a completely different part of the country, I heard that we were doing this regards to third party reporting, came down on the train, rode his bike about and wanted people to offend against him and started riding in a manner that probably encouraged offences against him. Um, and that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that puts people off. But the genuine victims, the genuine people who want to make their societies a, a safer place when it comes to those people who offend on the road. Um, that's what the system's there for. And so by using the feedback system um, and by improving it, improving the process, and like I said, the process is there, you know, 95% of it's there. It's only the feedback process that needs to be informed. 
we'll probably have what I would call what we'd be looking for, the golden chalice of oak policing, because it's 24 seven everywhere, all the time, and just puts that doubt in every driver's mind before they offend. Won't stop them all because we know what they like, um, but generally it will stop 95%. Um, and that's me done. Any questions? Yeah, that was brilliant, Mark, as ever. I'm, I'm glad we got that down. There are loads of people queuing up for questions. So I want to do it in the order that the hands came in. But, but I've got to ask you first, as Chair's prerogative, about um, about pavement parking and uh, viewing that. Just your perspective on that crime, as far as I've been said, it will be. There's lots of people I speak to with the industry that don't consider it a crime, whatever. Um, but yeah, just, just wanted to get your views on that. And I think it came up into the ch in the chat a few times as well. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I always taken seriously. And many years ago, and it was a long time ago, I was a neighbourhood, a neighbourhood police officer in Solihull, and pavement parking exists everywhere, you know. And the problems you get around honeypots like schools and workplaces, shopping centres, and the selfishness that you see. And as a result, I created Operation Park Safe, which is something like I said, like a disseminates neighbourhood policing level had a third party reporting function and works really well. Um, I don't, you know, I, I put it on, I did some episodes of Britain's Parking Health for Channel 5. And if anybody wants to see that there's about four or five episodes I'm on there and it covers the whole spectrum of what we did around schools, pavement parking and bits and pieces like that. Um, it's a strange thing. I, I, when you come out, so because obviously in London, pavement parking is not allowed in a lot of places in London you move away from London pavement parking is very much commonplace and it, it's one of those things that is really easily solvable and don't let anybody tell you it's not um, and like I said a lot of drivers don't realize what they're doing and once their selfishness is explained to them they then do it again those that don't they're really easily dealt with through the justice system and it's nicely ramped up because you can start with a £30 obstruction ticket. You then move up to leaving a motor vehicle in a dangerous position because we utilise in the West Midlands, the neighbourhood street watches go out and do it. So you've got these street watch groups, and they go out, they will find cars and, you know, and they're tried and trusted members of the public. So we know we're not going to have any issues with them and they'll take the photos of the cars parked on the pavement. They'll fill out this form saying we had to walk into a busy road to get around this car. So the, the, the danger is then evidenced as a result. And, you know, we've had some fantastic results in the West Midlands. I've had magistrates give out fines of £660 for an obstruction offence. Um, you know, um, and you've had people disqualified from drug driving. Um, on the base of third party reported offences for dangerous position stuff, um, zigzag offences at zebra crossings, really easy done. Um, pavement parking, I can cover it another time. Park safe is another whole thing in itself, um, and I've got numerous presentations on it. But really, um, it's something that has been copied. I've sent the package to police forces in Yorkshire, lots of the urban areas, if you like, Bristol. I've had officers contact me who've seen it on TV on the Channel 5 episodes and said, can you send us your stuff? And I've sent it off to them. Um, when it comes to legislation, new legislation about pavement parking, it's like a lot of things that the police deal with. We've, we've already got the tools to deal with it. We've just never been motivated or, you know, saw the need to do it before. Times are changing. You know, the lockdowns exhibited that. The amount of active travel, the amount of people walking. Um, you know, it, it's time, if you like, to reclaim pavement from people who park on them. Some people can park on a pavement in a very sensible manner. You know, there's no two ways about it. Uh, and you see it all, all the time. They don't cause any issues. Some people can't. And so we need to deal with those people that can't. There you go. Yeah, no, I think we'll have to have you back on that. It's a real hot topic and one that we're looking at really seriously in Greater Manchester as well. It's as bad as anywhere I've seen for pavement parking. I have to say, OK, I'm going to go through the hands now. Uh, Dave uh, Holiday, uh, your hand was up first. But did that hand ever go down, Dave? That's the. the... Okay, some quick comment. First of all, it's nice to think that uh, what's happening this way is a return to Sir Robert Peel's ethos of policing by consent, because the police are the people and the people are the police. So the people are an extension of the police that actually does the observation and the reporting, and you're paid to do the prosecution. Um, and. I like to use the term footway because, um, as you said, Mark, 
there are laws in place that tackle all of the issues with parking on and driving on a footway. Um, with the Police and Crime Commissioner elections coming up, is there a list of what we should be pressing PCCs to actually put the emphasis on their forces to enforce? Uh, rather like that you did get the um, community groups involved with footway patrols, taking the photographs, getting the reports done. Um, and the, uh, the, the other thing that's quite nice is that uh, probably about 10% of the vehicles that you pull actually have other offences. Yeah, I mean, I have to watch what I say because obviously we're in a time of purder at the moment. Um, and But what I would say is what, what you come back to um, regards, you know, the Pelian principles, it, it comes back to that, really. When it comes to PCCs and, you know, um, what the public want action, it's really a case of if you don't ask, you don't get um now i work you know for david jameson um he's you know he's been very good pcc to me um over the years we worked with him he was an ex-transport minister and so got it from the start um but most pccs will react to an evidential base you know um of here's the danger this is what's going to happen if you don't address the danger um, if you don't address the danger, it's going to cause you a lot more demand than actually the demand caused by addressing the danger in the first place. Because let's face it, if we have a God forsake a fatal collision because of somebody parking on the pavement, you know, which has, has happened, it's happened recently in the West Midlands Police as well, um, where somebody's been forced against the road as a parked vehicle and then has been run over and killed. You, you you know, it costs a lot of money. You're looking at over two million pounds when it comes to a fatal collision to society and then to the police force even more. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, addressing things that concern the community, again, it's a case of um, I go to or, you know, very much used to go to um, local community groups when they have their, their meetings and all sorts, you know, and, and listen to what they say. It's a case of you've got to listen to the public, see what their concerns are at a neighbourhood level and then address them it's just a case of connecting with the public in the in the first place but sometimes the public have to connect with the police you know it, i'll be the first to say it and i've been i've been bit guilty of it in the past you know the problem with the police is we think we know best and we don't a lot of the time um you know and i've been wrong in the past on things and it's only when you know people uh, on this very forum that we, we're talking on now have said have you ever thought about doing this and you think well but actually they're right you know maybe we should be doing that and for these reasons so really to case of you know you've got elections coming up um express your concerns you know see how those people react to them and then you know vote however you see best <laughs> that's the way to do it brilliant cheers Mark. we've definitely run beyond time but if you're happy mark i'm just gonna let these questions come through because uh it's it's yeah brilliant. carry on so, yeah all right brilliant we'll go to samuel then I'll go as quickly as I can because I can see so many hands up and I don't want to take everyone's time. Really quickly, Mark, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. I, on behalf of everyone here, it's just it's just great hearing those words about the, the response uh, with some of the police. I live in Northamptonshire and North Ants Police's responses are shocking. Uh, sorry, I, I say that the responses, they don't respond. So any any type of web of, of footage, dash cam footage, or video footage, instantly operations snap and they will not respond. So I uh, sp had an incident happen to me on Friday where I was close past. It was really really close. Uh, I reported it, but decided to do everything in my power not to go through Operation Snap. So I phoned up 101, reported it. I sent them the link to an unlisted YouTube video, and they said, no, we're not accepting it. And I said, please, I just want to get feedback. Has anything happened to the driver? Because uh, I want to get dangerous drivers off, off the road. And he said, uh, the, the person on the phone said, uh, no, you have to use this, and they wouldn't feed back. Now, I checked the Ministry of Justice's victim uh, code of practice and right six, it says to be provided with information 
about the investigation uh, and I would just like to hear that something's been done. What I've now ended up doing is not bothering to use the re report. I do film on my journeys, but I never report anymore. And it's so sad that I have lost that um, willingness to do it because I don't think anything happens. The other day I received a freedom information request response from a fellow person in Wellingborough. Uh, they got all of the data from the police. And I said, wait, you've got all of the data. I've been asking for it personally fed back to me. And they said, yes, we managed to get that. I checked and I could find five. So I had five recent reports and only one of them had been dealt with. And the rest of them have just, so, one, so three of them were dismissed. Uh, or three of them weren't even on the form. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, one of them, they didn't bother uh, because they couldn't contact the driver. So I, I do hear what you're saying about the demand increase, but I do think that some kind of electronic system of feeding back to people just to email a response and say, this has been dealt with by a education course or three points or uh, this, this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that would uh, be a response because I, I, the only reason I do, I do report in the, the rare case that I do is to get dangerous drivers off the road and make our streets a safer place to be. Sorry for going on and uh, babbling. Sorry about that. Good. Now, um, Samuel, first of all, thank you for reporting your stuff and making the effort. Um, it is appreciated. Like I said, as you know, as a traffic officer, I only speak to myself. I welcome any opportunity and any evidence to get a dangerous driver off the road. Um, you know, like I said, it, it, it's like, it's the open goal for me, if you like, because I don't have to do anything. There it is. Thank you very much you can have it then that's it that's the way it works um you've just reiterated really well i've said earlier why feedback is so important you're a, an active citizen what and you know active citizens one of those buzzwords in the police at the moment you know we love them because they contribute to society and make things safer um part of the reason is road crime for a long time well for, for eternity and it's only just starting to change hasn't been seen as crime by the police it's not it's seen as acceptable because everybody does it if you get what i mean um and so although like i said you know when it, you know you do have the victims charter um and so you have to be keeping kept updated regards an investigation if you put a statement in you have to be updated what happened with the offense it's there it's just not thought of in the same way that needs to change like i said um, you know, um, the normalisation of road danger in the UK is a crime in itself. It's something that we've let happen. It's something we've got to change. Um, and what you've just said about regards, you know, you put five things in and, you know, you've had one action, but you've got no feedback on the other. You know, you're an active citizen. We can use you. It may be the case that you need just a 10 minute phone call and somebody saying, well, you clip was good, but if you do this, every other clip you send in we could probably action you know there might be just a bit of missing link without seeing your clips i can't really comment and that's generally from from my you know experience what happens um we've got some people in the west midlands um that will submit in excess of 350 clips a year now um they work very closely with the traffic investigation unit and probably 99 percent of their clips are actioned so, you know, um, because, you know, this one person was so prolific at submitting mobile phone stuff that he was submitting more mobile phones in one year than seven forces put together. And they were all actioned, which was a win win for us. You know, absolutely stunning footage. He's running right alongside them. No problem at all. But he's got good contact with our traffic investigation unit. Like I said, the work stream from the police point of view has got to be recognised and valued before the investment goes in. Unfortunately, it's going to be work from it's extra work for myself to, you know, to, to do the business case analysis and say, this is what happens in the West Midlands. This is how much it costs. This is how easy it's to do. You can do this too and save yourself a lot of money. And by doing this, you can then utilise your traffic officers in offences that can't be reported in a third party manner. So when it comes to what you're doing, you're doing the right thing. Please keep submitting. That's what I will say through the, you know, the portal. Just bang them in, do the minimum, put them in. Um, and hopefully, you know, some forces are far in advance than others. You know, you, you look at the sort of North Wales, you look at ourselves in the West Mid, you look at the Met um, and other people are catching up 
all the time, you know, um, with the way that they'd view these fences. Um, it, we will get some kind of standardization eventually, but when I come back to what my presentation, like I said, it needs standardization and nationalization. You can't have met somebody in the West Midlands putting in the fence and thinking, you know, I know, you know, that's going to be dealt with and dealt with in the right way. And somebody like yourself putting in the fence thinking, you know what, I'm wasting my time. You can't have that disparity across the, across the nation with something that is so, you know, so, you know, um, necessary. Um, it's about time we woke up because the saving, you know, if you just reduce KSIs, you know, through say third party reporting, which is easily achievable by 20%, you're saving the country billions. You know, that's got to be recognised. Uh, it's got to be driven at a high level. Um, and like I said, it's down to people like me to, you know, I think I probably took it a bit easy recently, but maybe I've got to push myself forward again, start engaging with a few more politicians when the period is over and um, get it addressed at a higher level. Brilliant. Um, Thanks, well, I'm going to come to you at the end, so I'm going to move down to Chris Lowe. So Bob's had the last word on this. Chris Lowe, you have a question? So I'm in court as a witness tomorrow for a video I reported last year, and it's my second time going to court. Luckily, living in the West Midlands, I know that the stuff I submit to the West Midlands traffic police is, is, is dealt with. But talking to other people, there is a, people do, do not, some people don't see the value in, in reporting stuff because they're not, they've not got the confidence I have that the police will deal with it. And I, f I think definitely having that feedback would go a long way to getting people to, to feel more confidence. Um, so, so my question is, is there a way to get at least the base statistics? Are those published? Where can we find them? So as a cycle campaign group, can we do articles showing the statistics in the West Midlands? This was how many cases were reported. This is just just the broad brush stroke so that we can get it out there and show what's going on. Is it easy to do that? Before I finish, yeah. can I just say, I find riding with a video camera just makes me feel so much calmer. It's the empowerment. I know if something happens, I've got it on camera, I can report it and I feel so much better for that. It, it really is amazing the difference it makes to my mental health. Yeah, to just I'll start on that point there because it's one thing that I've written down my notes and I've mentioned when it comes to third party reporting, it, it's a great um, promoter of active travel. Um, that if people know that if they go out into a, an environment that is not always in their favour, where there's not the infrastructure, where they have you know got to go on a journey and it's very likely that somebody may endanger them in a motor vehicle on that journey if they know before they set out if anything does happen and they record it they've got that ability to then report it and then at least have a chance of making their journey that bit better next time because that person may have their behavior changed it encourages people to use active travel as, as a result as a result um, so that's the one thing that I didn't mention. I thank you for bringing it up. Um, when it comes to figures, um, the Traffic Investigation Unit in West Mids is run by a chap called Stu Baker. Fantastic, Stu, I've worked with him for years and he'll put out the figures every year. Today, I've just learned he's moved on. <laughs> he's gone to another department. I don't know who's running departments at moments, but transparency is a key aspect of what we do. Um, and yeah. Um, Professor Sally Kidd and Dr. Stephen Camis uh, worked with ourselves and they did a report and they looked at the, some third party reporting stuff um, a couple of years ago and they put out all the results um, through them. And really, you know, it's part again of effective feedback. Forces should be saying, we've got this from reports, this is how many we've actioned, this is how many we haven't. Then that then brings up other questions which you get at a, you know, the overall feedback level like the individual feedback level is why won't those reports action then and you feed that back and like i said right that could save some of the one-to-one -one feedback because if you're putting out a report each year saying well we lost 10 percent of our reports because of the submitted behavior was inappropriate and they could have had offenses 
against themselves. We lost 5% of our reports because they weren't timely, so we couldn't get the notice of intended prosecutions out. That then would then improve your initial product that you're getting through. Um, regards getting them from different people, it's the freedom of information request, I'm afraid. It's different from force to force. You know, I know that if you found the West Midlands Police Force and you spoke to myself or you spoke to Stu Baker and his in post and said, how many people, you know, just out of interest, how many have you prosecuted this year? You'll go, one moment, shh, and tell you. How many of you, you know, how many reports, how many of you prosecuted? No problem at all. Um, and that's the way we tend to work in the West Midlands. Other forces are different, so I can't speak for them. Um, but again, it, it's maybe something that at a national level through, you know, say the national police chiefs that they should say, right, from now on, we're going to have a focus on third party reporting and you're going to put out each year how many you do, how many you don't do and the reasons why. Um, because we think it's the way forward. I know when we were inspected by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, they were very interested in the work and they thought it was the way forward. So again, it's maybe something that's got to be, you know, driven at a higher level. If it's expected, then it's done, you know, you know, um, something we've got to look at and it will get better. The one thing to recognise is, is this is still very much in its infancy as, as a work stream and even going through courts all the time. Um, we started the Mean Steve back in 2014, 2015 with this. We're only in 2021 now. In policing terms, that's a very short period of time to get mechanisms in place and improve the product to perfection. Um, so, you know, bear with us. Um, and I want to say us, I don't just mean the West Midlands Police, I mean right the way across the country. Um, at some point, you will get standardisation, you will get the same product everywhere. We just, you, you know, need a bit of time. And, and a bit of effort, like I said, maybe I've got to do a bit more yet. Great stuff, uh, Elizabeth. We're going to keep them coming at you, Mark, until you run off. Uh, no, Karen. Cheers. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you're seeing any difficulties with, um, essentially, with racism, with the types of reports that come in, with, like, the population policing each other, lots of bias can come in. I was wondering if you're seeing that at all, worried about it. Um, it, it. I always said, if, if you want a view of racism in the UK, spend some time as a neighbourhood policing officer to see the sort of reports that you, you get come in, um, you know, um, from the general members of the public. Um, I know there's been a race report recently that's been widely debunked by everybody knows anything about races, but I can only speak, you know, not in academic terms, but only in personal terms. When it comes to driving offences, no, not at all, not an aspect whatsoever, uh, because drivers are fairly inconspicuous. When somebody endangers you, you don't see the driver at all. Um, and so, you know, th there's no no real opportunity for somebody to select somebody if you like because of their ethnicity or the other you know, forms of um bigotry and you know the like that we see because of their sex or, or whatever it doesn't exist drivers are generally anonymous aren't they they're not a driver when the offense is reported it's a registration plate and because these things happen that quickly, you, sometimes you can't even see how many people are in the car, let alone who's driving it. And that's the beauty of the system we use, if you, if you like. Up until the point the, point the report's put in, they are very much just a registration plate. A bit different for some other offences, like the mobile phone and stuff at slow speed, where you get a good view of the driver on camera and stuff like that. But again, you know, the, the, there's no the, there's no evidence of that. It, it works particularly, you know, particularly well. Most of the people, because the process is so um if you like pointed towards having a final result at court because that's what happens from the moment you report if you go through the next base portal there's a little caveat saying unless you fill out these statements and are prepared to go to court we don't want to know thank you very much see you later it puts off a lot of the time wasters um, and a lot of the people who may have, you know, not the right reasons for reporting people, if, if you like. And so, no, we, we've come across nothing like that, if you like. But like I said, sort of um, at a policing level, yeah, you, you see, unfortunately, you know, you, we see aspects of racism in other parts of society all, all the time. But, you know, um, when it comes to third party reporting, I'm glad to say, you know, it is, you know, 
as it is, it is literally third party and everybody remains anonymous until that notice of intended prosecution is filled in and said, I was the driver at the time. Thank you very much. So, yeah, there you go. Excellent. Uh, James, have a comment? Uh, hi, was that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks again. And I mean, you can come back every week and we're going to keep on adding, adding this stuff. Um, the only thing I'd say, there are, yes, obviously you could, um, you could give everyone a half an hour chat on every video submitted, but at some point you have a database here and there's a box and a box gets ticked. And I've tried to look at this across other police forces as well, obviously with, with the um, road crime thing I'm doing. And at the end of the day, it does fall into data category. Um, I know that a lot of these police defence databases aren't necessarily built, you know, they, they predate um, user submissions. At the end of the day, the, the police will have um, responses on every incident and they'll say, well, how do we know about it? Well, we already had an officer on patrol, we had a car there already, someone dialed 999, it came in via 101. It was an event where, you know, it was a football match where I'm not saying that that's necessarily a fan, but. You know, there already was, but there was a police presence there. There was a demonstration, there was a police already there. Um, it's a shopping centre with security. We know all this, so we know where the offence comes from. And uh, we know what has happened with each offence, because that range ranges from no further action through to, OK, and I'm glad you don't do warning letters, because I think a warning letter is unhelpful. But we then we graduate up from that, and I, and I think that sending the driver on a course is absolutely uh, an acceptable action. I don't think we should be saying, well, that's not good enough, because at the end of the day, the driver has to pay for that course. They have to take sometimes a half day off, um, and of course, it, it means that if they commit the same offence again, that's that's still going to be noted. So we've got to graduate the scale here from no action, course, final point. It goes to court. Nobody would expect you as West Liverpool Police to be telling us if something goes to court and then subsequently whether that driver is found guilty or not guilty or whether the case collapses because that then becomes a matter for the CPS but surely there is a database here and and I, I totally get that you could you know I've, I've had some feedback I think from, from Steve um, and I've had some very useful feedback from you because I've been involved in this program from quite early on but surely you can just you know, as I understand what the Met do, and I understand the Met are actually downgrading what they do, but they do still say actions, yes or no, course, NOIP, court. Can you can you at least do, do that? I mean, to give you another comparison, you know, I was fortunate I only took my driver's test once, but it's still, it's pass or fail. Everything else that the, that the examiner gives you is, is an optional extra. It's useful to know, uh, and I know that I, I asked him, I said, I, look, I only took a rubbish truck approaching the junction. And he was like, no, no, that's fine, because you gave it plenty of space and you, you, know, you did it in time. So he gave me useful additional feedback. But at the end of the day, everything else about your driving standards, if you fail your test, is actually up to your instructor to, to tell you, because your instructor doesn't sit with you during, during the driving test. So I, I think there's so much, you've given so much more to work on with, with parking offences as well. But is there is there a way that you could just provide even the most basic yes or no feedback? Because what we everyone's watching what West Midlands do here. You could, but like I said, you, you can you look to improve the process, uh, and that's the thing. And being inquisitive humans that we are, and I can speak from some personal experience, is that when somebody tells you this driver got six points and three hundred pound fine. Um, and then straight away, I'll look at the result. The first thing I do then is phone the CPS prosecutor and go, well, hang on, what about this offence? What happened with this? And, you know, and what about this? And what about this? Because we're inquisitive and we need to know. And, and so people, if you did have a database that said this person, you know, it was NFA, people want to know what, why was no further action taken? What was wrong with my evidence? You know, and that's a vital part of the process because we don't want to lose those people. Then the people who go, oh yeah, it was a course. Okay, what a course this time, um, right, what course? Yeah, what, what's he gonna learn on that course? Because I think what we've got to remember is, is, is that 
for people like yourself, James, you know, you, know, you, you, you were with me and Steve in the early days, really, weren't you, in Coventry, is that a lot of these people are new to the process and we, we don't want to lose them. And they've their interaction with the process will be maybe just one or two offences th throughout their, you know, their lifetime. Hopefully, fingers crossed, they're not, you know, repeat victims. And so it, it's very important to them that that may be their sole interaction with the police. And we need it to be a positive one and we need them to get everything out of it that they deserve to get. And so they need the full picture. So, you know, some people um, will go out and it may not be a cyclist. It may not be um, somebody walking. It might be a driver who then sees a piece of driving. And, you know, I'll give you an example from personal experience. I've had some issues pushes where off a chap where his wife's come home um, from a commute from work in a car. She's walked in in tears and said, oh, I've had this happen to me. Somebody ran me off the road. Then they did this and this and this. And this. Um, you know, that is probably going to be our only interaction with the police um possibly for the whole of her life and so you need to make sure it's a right and proper interaction she needs to come away from that with a very positive feeling from it and so they it's for me it's vital you know that everybody gets the amount of feedback that they deem necessary for somebody like yourselves james who's you know very affair with the process um and you know you knows how the system works you know been to court no problem at all but we've got to offer a facility for those that need it to have the nth degree of feedback and rightly so um because they put the time and the effort into giving us the opportunity to take these people off the roads and prosecute them we then need to give them the time and opportunity to have the empowerment that they deserve through full feedback so while minimum feedback might work for yourself um because you've had a contact you know along the way with me and Steve and other people from the West Midlands Police and you go to court and you get to and, you know have that exchange of information with CPS, um, it won't work for everybody. So you've got to have a process that facilitates everybody, um, no matter what the basis is or what the outcome of their submission is. I hope that makes sense. Excellent. Bill, bring you in now. Thanks for waiting. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe we could take this offline, but um, I'd really welcome picking your brains. Um, I chaired a task force last year for the Welsh Government looking at how they could bring in civil enforcement for um, uh, pavement parking in Wales, because obviously you, know, you were taking action, but most police forces in Wales don't. And, and we, we've been working, I'm, I'm now working on the, the guidance, trying to um, Trying to use the construction and use regulations of unnecessary obstruction um, and we're trying to come up with some you know, practical tests for what unnecessary obstruction means um so yeah if if, if, you, if you're able to drop me an email to my I'll, I'll put my email in the chat but it, if you want to make a note of it it's just um bill at uh, pja.co.uk uh and that'll be great you're gonna have a chat sometime yeah no problem at all i mean i have, I have a, a real issue with civil enforcement when it's it's, it's um, sent down to council level because at the moment council can do lines and signs and they don't do it very well um, you know you see lots of people parked on double yellow lines you see lots of people parked on red lines you see lots of people parked in bus stops and taxi ranks and nothing ever happens to them and you know very rarely do you see a traffic warden even somewhere like you know Birmingham and I know how hard pressed they are because I've done joint operations with civil enforcement before and I know the sort of abuse that they take and a lot of the time they, they won't go out in parts of Birmingham without you know some kind of you know PCSO or police officer being with them and, and rightly so um it's something I'd like to see kept at a police level purely because of the danger element of it um, you know, as roads go, you know, as traffic increases or decreases, you know, you can argue whichever way you want. The danger is still going to remain um, with parking offences. Um, every day I see people genuinely in danger by pieces of selfish parking. Mm. When we deal with offences through Operation Park Safe, they're dealt with for all the right reasons. I wouldn't want to see civil enforcement and a even if it's a false economic tag put on that if you like you know they're only doing it to raise money not at all 
And, you know, yeah. that's the only problem I have with, with civil enforcement of offences like that. And do decriminalisation of a, of a lot of traffic enforcement, if you like. Um, the end result of most traffic offences is, unfortunately, death or serious injury um, to too many people every day. Um, if you decriminalise them and have them in the hands of local government, I, I think you lose sight of the reason why we do it, and it's to protect people. That's it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if the police were doing it, I think, you know, if at the moment, unfortunately, most of, of um, authorities don't. I mean, to say that the, the proposal is that um, local authorities would be able to enforce it, but it wouldn't mean that the police couldn't also enforce obstruction, so it wouldn't replace it. It would be in addition to, so it would be extra resources mm. that the local authorities could do. But that that's, I mean, they haven't, <clears throat> you know, it's not gone through the Welsh Parliament yet, but that's the proposal. But we just and and the Department for Transport is is kind of watching quite closely what we're doing in Wales. So um, I know that they they consulted last year on what they should do about pavement parking and whether they should bring in a London style ban or decriminalise it obstruction or just leave the the current system. And they haven't come back yet and said what they want to do in England. But Wales has decided to go down the decriminalisation route. Um, so that, that's. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of, of where you can get better along. In the West Midlands, we have some enormously large pavements where you could park a car completely on the pavement and you could park another car by the side of it. And people yes. often do, and it's the way it's been for a long time. And, you know, and I, I will walk or drive past that car knowing that, you know, it's not causing an issue. Yeah, it's driven on the pavement. Yes, it shouldn't be there. Yes, technically it's an obstruction. But, you know, you could get five wheelchair users through in the gap that's left in some places. And so it's not an issue for me. And so I'll let that go because I'm more interested in what's causing a danger to people. When it comes to civil enforcement, you know, that wouldn't go. It'd just be an easy ticket for a civil enforcement officer. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, the, I, don't, I just don't want to lose sight of what we do and the reasons why. Um, sure. the, yeah, that, that, that's the one thing. And you, you can put out mixed messages, especially when you're trying to change public behaviour. Um, it is a really and, tricky yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me take this offline. It's really, really good to have a chat with you about you know practical implications of it. Would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, Brian. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you contact Brian, Brian's got my work me email address, and I'm yeah. sure he'll share it with you, or um, Robert will share it with you, likewise, and drop me uh, an email. Um, I'm currently on holiday at the moment, and <laughs> what happens on holiday is that my wife takes my phone and my work phone off me, um, so I can't look <laughs> at them. Generally, I've had an exemption today, so that's why I've been quite prolific on Twitter today on my own personal account. But from tomorrow, I'll be back to getting my phones back for an hour a day, and that'll be in an, in an effort to try and get me to switch off. But uh, when I return to work, if you drop me an email, if Brian or Robert get, pass on my email address, or to anybody else that wants to ask me a question, I'll, I'll answer them in full when I get back. Brilliant. Yeah, we'll try not to add too much to your demand. And then just <laughs> Just on that, a couple more questions, and I'll just let Ruth, because she's been wanting to ask you this question, and then I'll let Bob wind it all up for our extra long edition, but it's been brilliant. Go on, Ruth. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Mark, as usual. Um, uh, advanced stop lines. Um, we now have lots of cycle routes in Chiswick, wonderful cycle routes, but the moped drivers use them all the time. They come forward, sit in them, they left hook you. Drivers drive into them. We keep being told, well, if the lights were changing when they've driven into them, then it's not an offence. And the fact is that nobody is um, is taking any notice of them. I keep being told, well, then, you know, you shouldn't have ASLs because they don't work. But the fact is that we have them and therefore the, they should be a crime to be driving in them. And if I go ahead of the white line ahead of an ASL so that I can be seen by the driver, I can be ticketed and a friend of mine was ticketed for that very thing. We must have action on this because it's crucial. Yep, I mean, we did, I say we did an operation. Um, me and Steve did an operation probably about three years ago in Birmingham um, around ASLs. And we did a month of education first where we 
it, it, I mean, it wasn't, you know, nothing to advance. We stood there in full uniform at, you know, a busy junction with ASLs on all four, you know, in, the entrance and ex, um, entrances into the junction. And we filmed the drivers who con made the contraventions and we sent them out um, a warning letter with full explanations from the highway code of what you couldn't do and couldn't do. And we put it all on social media. And then after a month, we just started ticketing people. Um, it's something that crops up every now and then on third party reporting. Um, like I said, when it comes to feedback again, people need to realize that obviously, you know, some people contravene ASLs, but they will do as part of the traffic light signal process. So if they're waiting to make progress through the junction and the lights change and they're across, then trapped in the ASL as a result, there's no offense. But then you've got to remember that ASL is effectively a stop line. So if they're approaching a red traffic light and then go across the first stop line into the ASL, they commit a red traffic light offence. The problem we have is that there's no specific legislation and you reprocess them for a red traffic light offence because that's what they're committing. They go across a stop line that they shouldn't do. So then once we've done all this work, we couldn't get the figures. We couldn't, you know, apart from our own figures, you know, we couldn't get the figures out to say, you know, this is how many tickets have been out. This is how all the different disposals because they just go through traffic light offences. Um, the problem I have with ASLs is firstly, they're not big enough. Um, you know, it should be a much larger area. Um, but that's a design issue. Um, Secondly, is that you're right, they're not enforced enough, enforced enough, um, and they're very easily enforced. Um, it can be done by somebody, like I said, just standing there in uniform at an ASL for half an hour a day. And you don't need to do a lot of it, is the other thing that I need to add, is because what you do with any sort of offending is you, you take a group of offences say to the general driving public this is what we're doing this is how we're doing it you know this is what could happen to you you put it in the right places they see it and they think oh i won't do that then fair enough they've just got to know do it. it again it's just a bit of effort putting into you know um doing it in the first place um the the person who contravened who got ticketed for the red light on the bicycle um if you like, they had in law a reasonable excuse for doing it, if it was for their own safety, to get ahead of the traffic, to be seen, to not end up under the wheels of a truck or a car that had contravened an ASL. Um, I'm a bit disappointed in the prosecution along those lines, but, you know, it's one of those things, people have a ticket and they'll pay it, you know, sometimes it shouldn't have happened again. You know, there's, there's lots of reasons why sometimes people commit offences, especially if you're a, a vulnerable road user. Um, and, you know, you just got to be a bit vocal about it. Um, probably one that if it was me, I would have, I would have um, took all the way to court. <laughs> As a result, that's it, yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's something that needs to be done more of. Uh, we've been there and done it again uh, in the past. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it happens that often in the West Midlands now, apart from third party reports and offences. But this is one of those things about third party reports and offences again. Um, you can submit these offences um, via third party to the point where you don't need the police to do it if you act, if you action the offences right, action the evidence right, and then put it out there in the right places, make drivers aware and change their behaviour. Um, it's one of those things that you can go to a police force and say, you should be enforcing ASLs, but if you took all the evidence from cycle cams and people standing at the side of the road, you know, other road users, I've had drivers um, submit um, footage of ASL contraventions, especially um, driving instructors, funnily enough. It was, it's a real bugbear with, you know, because they're saying to their, 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 their learner driver, if you drive into that ASL, contravene that, you know, put your wheels across that first stop line, you're going to fail your driving test. You know, and they're collecting footage all the time because all the driving instructors have got dash cams. And I've had quite a few submissive from driving instructors. So it's one of those things that you don't need a specific policing operation for, just get your third party reports in right and it'll, you know, solve itself with a, the right sort of media coverage. Nice. Okay, Bob, I've made you wait long enough. Uh, let's start wrapping up now. I've got my daughter screaming for milk before bedtime. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thanks very much to, to Mark uh, in this very special, unusual, extended edition. 
Uh, we've had um, uh, Damien Devani from a Avon Somerset Police on here as well. And I wanted to show, say that this just shows that active travel people are not just interested in infrastructure. They realize the importance of overall cultural change uh, involving enforcement and uh, the very wonderful work done by uh, Mark and his colleagues. So that's all. Brilliant, Bob. Yeah, no, that, I'll echo that. Thanks, Mark. And I'll, I'll have to get you back again and, and keep adding to your time to do pavement parking, which is like a... Yeah, well, that was covered before. if you want, I'll do park safe next time. And then at some point, I'd like to do something that we did wrong, just to say that, <laughs> you know, there is a learning process. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll email Bob with some dates. Brilliant. Well, that'll be a shorter session. Yeah, so yeah, we will go back to Aaron Hall, but you had a week off last week, so just uh, torturing everybody this week to see, see who's with us at the end. Um, yeah, all right, okay, Ruth, do you want to do a last word? And I'm all get ready for the anniversary. Very, very fast. Yeah, um, I always refer to Holland, but what is so notable in this country is we have so many lines where you can't park, and what we really need is lines where you can park, and then you know, even on brand new cycle lanes, like along Q Road, they've got double yellow lines along the outside of them to say to people, you can't cycle on a cycle, you can't park on a cycle lane. We've got to get out this mentality of too much parking and really make it only space where you can park and forget all these double yellows, double reds. The more lines we've got, the less people are taking any notice. <laughs>